Well, as you already noticed, our call to worship was Acts 1-8. And as Kim brought up, our scripture for today is from Luke chapter 4, where Jesus returns out of the uh, wilderness after fasting for 40 days, and he comes into the temple and he opens to that particular scripture. And it happens to be the same scripture that Pastor Donnie used last week from Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to do all the things he's called me to do, right? So, the problem is, though, I'm not going to use those scriptures today. <laughs> Let me tell you what happened. Sometimes when you're preparing for a sermon, well, not sometimes, all the time, when you're preparing for a message, you get into it and you get more information then you've got time to share. You know how that goes? And so you got to figure out, well, I'm going to cut out this and cut out this. Well, it got to be so overwhelming this week that I said, I just can't cut out all of this stuff. So instead of cutting it out, what we're going to do is split the message in half. So we'll get half of the meat this week and half of it three weeks from now when I'm back in the pulpit again, okay? And consequently, <coughs> these two scriptures from today go at the very end of the message. So you won't get them until the end of the message next time. But perhaps a better scripture uh, to use for today would be Psalm 119, verse 18. And it says this, Open my eyes that I may see wondrous three things from your law. And that's how this particular message came to be. I was reading the scripture one day and God opened my eyes to see something wondrous out of his word. And I said, Lord, what in the world is going on here? And here's, what, here's where it is. Let me show you how tell you how this got started here. I was reading in Joshua about the children of Israel getting ready to cross the Jordan into the Promised Land. Now, if you remember, when the waters backed up and, and, and separated, the river became dry, they all crossed over. And when they did, uh, they did something. They picked up some stones out of the riverbed. Does anybody remember how many stones they picked up out of the riverbed? Twelve. Anybody else? Twelve sound pretty good to everybody? <laughs> they did pick up 12, but that wasn't all. I'm reading, and all of a sudden I realized they picked up 24. There was two sets of 12. And I said, Lord, you don't put things in the Bible by mistake. What is this about? There's some meaning behind this, symbolism behind this. Anyway, that started me on a journey of learning about the Jordan River. And that's why you'll see on the screen, it says the Jordan River, there's more than meets the eye. There's a lot hidden in there. So, this morning what we're going to see in the Jordan River is that God has hidden some things in there. He's hidden um, the whole story of the redemption of mankind. And so today we're going to see the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in the Jordan River. We're going to see the creation of man and the fall of mankind and the redemption of mankind by the cross of Jesus Christ. So there's a whole lot hidden in this river here, and I hope that you'll enjoy this as much as I enjoy uh, sharing this particular message. So let's begin with the uh, basic layout of the Jordan River. And you know that Israel sits on the far eastern side of the Mediterranean Sea, and it's kind of a, a narrow country. It, it's, it's tall north to south and then a little bit narrow on the sides. And the Jordan River pretty much runs from the far north of Israel all the way down into the south. And it begins at the far north at a place called Mount Hermon. And let's see if we're going to work here. We're off, we're on. <laughs> there we go. Oh, and I, I now it's going to pick up with all the clicks that I want to add on. I knew I shouldn't keep clicking it there. Yeah. I used to tell my dad when I was teaching him how to work the computer, stop clicking the mouse. It's going to take a minute to get there, you know? Okay, now we're just, we're just on the ball. I'm clicking the back arrow and it's going forward. So. Yeah, you can it. It is, it's going to back up all the way to who knows where when this thing gets done. I'll tell you what. Hold up just a second because you're clicking and she's clicking. I'm not clicking. Oh, okay. Okay. Let's, let's, let's. <laughs> okay, while we're getting this figured out, we're going to press on so we don't get too far behind here, okay? 
couple important things about uh, the Jordan River. It begins in Mount Hermon, which is on the far sides of the north of Israel, okay? And Mount Hermon is kind of a neat, unique place because you can see it from pretty much all of Israel. They say you can be in the far south, and on a clear day you look north, and you see the snow-capped mountains of Hermon, and there it is. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Coach. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see Mount Hermon up there. And Mount Hermon is known as a sacred mountain, and it is also called the Mountain of God. And that's where the River Jordan has its um, origination there. One of the interesting things about Mount Hermon, there's a lot of uh, biblical things that happened up there. One of the neat things was that's the place that Jesus took Peter, James, and John, and they went up on the high mountain. That was Mount Hermon. So somewhere up on that peak, that's where Jesus was transfigured before them, and the apostles saw Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Can you imagine being in that, in that situation there? And then seeing the glory of God appear and hearing the voice of the Father booming out. So that all happened right there on Mount Hermon. Now you would assume that since Mount Hermon is the mountain of God, it's a sacred mountain, that all of Israel would have respected that over the years and just honored that place and reverenced that place. But you know what happened? We've read the Old Testament. We know that Israel, just like us, they, they backslid many, many times, didn't they? And when they backslid, they would worship false gods, pagan gods. Well, they actually went up onto Mount Hermon, the mountain of God, and set up statues and shrines and altars to pagan gods in the very presence of the mountain that represented the presence of God. So <coughs> we're going to see some more about that in just a few minutes here. Now, the River Jordan begins on Mount Hermon, and it has three primary head streams. And depending on which commentator you read, you're going to find out some will say three, some will say four. But as you get into it, you find out there's a whole bunch of little streams feeding into Mount Hermon coming off this snow-capped mountain up there. But there's basically three, and in my story, there's one for the Father, one for the Son, and one for the Holy Spirit. And the one for the Father is called Nahal Dan. And Nahal simply means river, and Dan means judge, or God is my judge. So since God the Father is the judge of all the world, right, it, it's fitting that his tributary here would be Nahal Dan, the judge. The one for the son is called Nahal Sanir. I didn't even click it. It's coming right up. <laughs> this is working great. You guys should let go of this thing. So, and Nahal Sanir... Um, represents Jesus. And this is really interesting because Sanir means breastplate. Now what, do we, what is the armor that we put on? The breastplate of righteousness. righteousness. And he is our righteousness. So this river represents the righteousness of Christ. And another interesting thing about this particular um, head stream here is this one flows out of a cave. You can see it in the picture. It flows out of the rock. Who is our rock? Jesus. He is the source of living water. So that is why Nahal Sanir represents Jesus. And then there's another uh, head stream that represents, of course, the Holy Spirit. So, one of the interesting things we see here is we've got, we serve a God that is three in one. He is one God, but he reveals himself to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? So we see three head streams coming together to form one, the Jordan River. Well, let's keep moving on from there because if you go back to creation, God created the heavens and the earth, and then he created man, didn't he? He created Adam, and he says, and he's talking to himself. Father, Son, and Spirit are sitting around having a conference, and they say, got an idea. Let's create man in our image. Let's make him in our image. Well, guess what is right below the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit on the Jordan River as you come down? There's a city. Guess what it's called? Adam. <laughs> And if you look at the Jordan River just above Adam, and look at the Jordan River that flows through Adam, it looks the same. Adam was made in the image of God. You see, God was created to, or Adam was created to walk with God. Man, all of us were created to walk with God. And the presence, that flow of God, was meant to flow through us so that we could in turn touch the world. Amen? So... Man was created to be with God and for his life to flow through him. Now, there's another interesting scripture that, that really kind of supports this in a neat way, and it's Psalm 8, verse 5. And that's not the one. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that later. 
you know what? This is kind of cool. I'm hitting up and it doesn't go up, it goes down. I, I got to get down and then it goes the right way. I got it. Okay, so we're good. Psalm 8 verses 4 and 5 says this, What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels. But in the original Hebrew, that word angels is not angels, it's Elohim, God or gods. So what the scripture is actually saying, for you have made man a little lower than God. And so when you look at the Jordan River, where is Adam? Just a little lower down the stream than God. So it's kind of a, a neat thing there, huh? It, it's uh, been suggested that when they um, transcribed the Old Testament, that the, the guys that were writing it, they, they just could not comprehend that man could have been made lower than God. Now this, so they put in angels there, that, that he's lower than angels. So, we see Adam and Eve were created in the image of God, but then something bad happened, didn't it? What happened in the garden? Man fell. He sinned. He was tempted by the devil. The serpent, or Satan as we know him, tempted Adam and Eve, and they fell from the presence of God. So let's take a look at how that played itself out in the Jordan River. And to do that, we've got to go to the year just a little bit before 300 B.C., and there was a man that lived at that time by the name of Alexander the Great, a very young man. He conquered most of the known world by the time he was 21, a very powerful military. But what happened is he's moving across the earth, conquering places. He's taking everything they got. You know, we'll take your gold, your silver, and oh, by the way, we want all your gods. So all these pagan gods, these statues and stuff, Alexander says, bring them along. I want them all. You know, if there's any god that's got anything for me, I want all of them. So he's stealing all their gods, and as he moves across into the land of Israel, he comes to Mount Hermon, and he decides, I'm going to make a city here where I can put all these gods. So he sets them <coughs> up in a city and names it Panias, or it may have been named Panias before, but Panias is in reference to the Greek god Pan, and that is one of the Greek gods that he brought with him. And let me see if I'm ready for that one here. Oh, yep, we are so hit the down button again, see if we got it. There we go. I got it working now. So we've got the Greek god Pan, who is the shepherd god. And it's interesting, guess where he sets all this stuff up in this city? That's the city that has the head stream that represents Jesus. And he goes right to the rock where the river flows out that represents Jesus and sets up this image that we would call the devil. This is where we get our picture of the devil as Christians. It's from the Greek god Pan. He's got horns, hoofed feet, you know, a tail, all of this stuff. And very closely related to the Greek god Pan is the god Hades, who is the Greek god of the underworld. So, what is the spiritual significance of him setting this statue where Jesus is supposed to be? Let's take a look at Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, and there's going to get, they are going to give us some insight into Satan before he was Satan, because before he was Satan, who was he? Lucifer. He was a very prominent angel in heaven. So, Ezekiel 28, I've just got a few of the uh, parts of that here, but I'll read the whole thing for you. It says, you were in Eden, the garden of God, every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz, and diamond. Beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. Can you imagine this angel decked out with jewels and gold? And he actually had musical instruments built into his body. He was a worshiping angel. It says, you were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created until iniquity was found in you. So in heaven, Lucifer, who would later become Satan, he had access to all the holy mountain of God. He was in the Garden of Eden, it says, when man was created. That's interesting, isn't it? And I believe that this is the place where, where he sinned and iniquity was found in him. I believe he became jealous of mankind. Here he was. He had this position, this dominion and authority in heaven. He was somebody up there. 
But all of a sudden, he looks down, and this little creature, created out of the dust of the earth, is made in God's image and given position greater than his. He became jealous. He became prideful. And all of a sudden, he wanted to be a God himself. Let's listen to what Isaiah 14 says. It says, How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the depths of the pit. Satan wanted to be like God, and so God kicked him out of heaven because of his pride. But he doesn't give up, does he? Once he's vanquished to the earth, he, he's, I'm going to be known for it. I am going to be like God. So what happens here? Pan gets the image of Satan gets set up in the place of Jesus Christ on this mountain. He wanted to be like God, to sit his throne with God on this mountain here. What did he say? He said, I will also sit on the mount of the congregation of the farthest sides of the north. Where is Mount Hermon? It's on the farthest sides of the north. See how that's all starting to come together there a little bit? And one other thing about um, Pan there and, and Satan, Pan is the shepherd god of the Greeks. And who is Jesus? He's the great shepherd. You see, Satan has nothing original of his own. He has to steal from God. He looks at God and gets envious and says, I want to be like that. Okay, I'll, I'll make myself a shepherd god. You know, he turns himself into an angel of light. So we'll see him as a certain way, but it's just so deceptive, isn't it? He's not God. He, he's full of lies and deceit. In fact, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 11 that <coughs> Satan transforms himself into an angel of light. He tries to appear as something that he's not. And have you ever noticed that Satan, when he tempted Eve, he actually tempted her with the exact same temptation that he was tempted with? He wanted to be like God, and what did he tell Eve? You can be like God. You can know right from wrong. You can be like God, Eve. You can be like God, Adam. Tempting her the same way. And when Adam and Eve fell, Satan kind of got a little bit of what he was after. Because when they fell, Satan became what Paul calls the God of this world. God, little g. So, Adam and Eve fell from the presence of God. And this is also represented in the Jordan River. Jordan itself means their descent or their fall because of judgment. So as we see mankind way up there, a little below God, he's falling, and he's falling, and he's falling away from the presence of God. And what is his final destination going to be? You follow the Jordan River. It, 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 it flows, it comes down a long ways down. In fact, when it ends up, it's in the Dead Sea, isn't it? And the Dead Sea just happens to be the lowest place on earth. There's no place lower than that. Very symbolic, isn't it? It, could anybody but God have created this and arranged all this stuff, you know? I don't think so. So, <clears throat> the Dead Sea is dead because it has no outlet. The river flows into it, and nothing ever flows out. And it represents hell itself, because once people enter into hell, there is no escape. There's no way back out. It has to happen before you get into hell. Jesus says in Matthew 18, 8, if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It's better for you to enter into life maim, uh, lame or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into the everlasting fire. The everlasting fire. So Jesus says there's no way out and it's everlasting. There's not going to be any end to it once hell starts. So we see the River Jordan. It represents the downward fall of man. It represents the sin of man. And it represents the final destiny of hell for those who do not accept Jesus' salvation. Now, before Adam and Eve sinned, God had given them dominion. Remember that? He said, let us give them dominion over all the fish, over all the animals, over all the earth. In other words, man had rule and authority over everything in the earth. But when they sinned and they believed Satan instead of God, 
What they actually did was they bowed their knee to Satan and they handed over all their dominion, all their authority in the earth. And that's when Satan became the god of this world. Romans 6, Paul tells us, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, that you are that one's slaves whom you obey? So they became slaves of Satan. They became his property. And as a result of that, what did Satan have the right to do now? Satan had the right to possess them, to oppress them, to torment them, to accuse them, and to bring sickness and disease upon their lives. Our God brings life. Satan brings death. Jesus said, the enemy, the thief, comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that you might have life. So this is the terrible condition that mankind found himself in. Things are looking really bad. And unless somebody comes to help, you know, they're going to be in a bad way. It took one man to sin that brought all of mankind into this fallen condition. But now it's going to take one man walking in total righteousness who refuses to bow his knee to the devil to bring man back, to rescue man, to save us from our sins. So let's go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 here. And we're going to go to the Dead Sea instead. <laughs> let's go up. No. Somewhere I'm missing a slide. You just didn't go far enough. I after didn't go far enough? After okay. the Dead Sea. Ah, okay. Oh, that's right. Okay, so I missed the Dead Sea. There we go. Great. Thank you, Pat. So, in Genesis 3.15, God begins to reveal his plan on how he's going to redeem mankind. And he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He's speaking to the devil. And he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And I like the way that NIV reads in this particular scripture a little bit better, but I think it's more accurate. God says... He will crush your head, and you will strike at his heel. You know, I don't think Jesus just bruised his head. I think he just crushed it. You know, God is powerful. And that's the very first prophecy of the Messiah that's going to come and save us from our sins by his own death on the cross. Now, remember I said that Alexander the Great brought Pan and Hades and set them all up at the, at, at the mouth of the river there where... Um, uh, that represented Jesus at the head screen there. Well, he also brought all these hundreds of other gods that were going to be there. In fact, that <coughs> place became very popular, Panias. In every place there was a multitude of these gods set up, became a vacation destination. And I'm not kidding you. I think people were using their frequent camel miles to take their vacations. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we're going to go spend some time and hang out with Hades and Pan and all these other guys, you know, up in Panias there. And, but people actually did that. That was part of their pilgrimages every year. So it's kind of crazy there. But let's take another look at this city, Panias, here. Interesting history to this city here. It was later renamed to Banias, and later after that, just before the time of Christ, renamed to Caesarea Philippi. How many of you recognize that name? Caesarea Philippi. And you probably recall that one day Jesus has his disciples. And he goes to this place called Caesarea Philippi, and this is where he's at, where all these foreign gods are set up, where Pan is set up in the entrance of the cave that represents him. He's standing right there, and in the midst of that place, he looks around and he says, who do men say that I am? And you know they come up, well, some say you're this, some say you're that, and all that. But then he says, but who do you say that I am? And all of a sudden, Peter, it's like this light comes on in his head, and he says, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says to him, he says, Blessed are you, Simon bar -Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven, my Father has revealed this to you. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Some people used to complain and they say, I don't like that they said Hades there in that scripture. It should be hell. I'll call it hell if it's hell, not Hades, you know. But Jesus was calling it what it was. Because you see, Hades, it could re represent hell, but it also represented the Greek god, Hades, the god of the underworld, who was who? Satan. Pan and Hades represent the same thing, Satan. So he says, the gates of Satan, is what he's saying, are not going to prevail against my church. So what is happening up in here? is Jesus is making a powerful, powerful declaration. 
And he goes to this place for a specific reason. The father, one, leads him to this place. But then you just kind of see what's going on. I mean, this is just blowing my mind here. When I think about what's happening, he says, but who do you say that I am? And all of a sudden, God the Father, who is, of course, present with Jesus right there, he just comes down into Peter's heart. And he, just, he just drops this spirit of wisdom and revelation like this. And Peter's just he's feeling something. He's I can see it. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And what was he saying with that proclamation? He's saying, you're the Christ, the Christ, the anointed one of God, with his anointing, the Messiah. You're the one that's been prophesied from the very beginning of time. In other words, Adam was a prophet. Did you know that Adam was a prophet? And every prophet from Adam prophesied about the coming of Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden, everything they prophesied about you, you're the one, you're here. <coughs> and so Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon by bar You know, my father's revealed this to you. And upon this rock, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of Hades are not going to prevail against it. So he's just making a powerful declaration here, isn't he? And as soon as he leaves this place, the scripture says he begins to tell them how he's going to do it. As soon as that happens, the scripture says, he starts telling his disciples, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, and I'm going to be persecuted and beaten and all these things, and I'm going to be killed, but I'm going to raise on the third day. That's how we're going to build my church. Amazing. So, as the political pundits would say, there's a new sheriff in town. <laughs> and his name is Jesus. I went online and found this picture of Jesus. Then I went online and found a sheriff's badge. It's a Texas sheriff's badge. But it was a gift, so it didn't have anything around it, so I could stick it right on Jesus there. And after I get it out, I'm like, oh, glory to God, it's a star of David. <laughs> doesn't get any better than that, does it? <laughs> so let's recap just for a second here. So far, we've seen in the Jordan River the Trinity, the creation and fall of mankind. The river Jordan, which means their descent or their fall because of judgment. We see Satan ascending the sides of the north of Israel on the mountain of God to take his place as God, which he said he wanted to do. And what else have we seen? And we've seen um, the, the, the Dead Sea down there, which represents hell there. So, and we've also seen Jesus coming into the stronghold and declaring his intentions to take back his kingdom. So let's continue on with our story and see how this plays out in the River Jordan a little bit further here. So now we're going to get back to Joshua crossing the River Jordan, and that happened about 1,400 years before the time of Jesus. Now, if you remember in that story, Moses had just died, and God puts Joshua in charge, and he says, okay, the river's at flood stage, that's the promised land over there, and you're going to lead the people out of the wilderness into the promised land, and here's how you're going to get across this river right here. So, just a little side note for you, the people that Joshua were, were leading, their promised land was the physical land of Israel. But for us as Christians, our promised land is God himself. Jesus died so that we could be restored to God himself, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, Joshua, God tells Joshua to tell the children of Israel that the priests who are carrying the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders... They're to go into the river first, okay? Everybody else is going to follow along behind them. So let's read that story here. And I don't have the scriptures for you, but we do have crossing the Jordan. Here they go. Um, I don't know who the guy was that stood back and painted this as it happened, but he was talented, so very good. So in Joshua 3, it says this, So it was when the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and as those who bore the ark came to the Jordan, and the feet of the priests who bore the ark dipped in the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks during the whole time of harvest, that the waters which came down from upstream stood still and rose up in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zaratan. So the waters that went down into the Sea of Arabah, the salt sea of the Dead Sea, failed and were cut off. And the people crossed over opposite Jericho. Then the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. And all of Israel crossed over on dry ground 
until all the people had crossed completely over the Jordan. Remember that the Ark of the Covenant, what, what, what did that contain? The presence of God. It was the very presence of God. And how did the priest carry it? On two poles, didn't they? So what did the two poles represent? The cross of Jesus. The two poles that Jesus was uh, uh, crucified upon. So what we see is an image of Christianity, of Christians here. They're carrying the presence of God on the cross, on the two poles. And as Christians, we have the presence of God in us. Why? Because of the cross of Jesus Christ. So they're very symbolic of New Testament Christians here. And listen to what happened um, as this is going on. When the priest's feet who carried the ark stepped into the water, something happened. Now remember, they're carrying the presence of God and the poles representing the cross of Jesus. And what are they stepping into? They're stepping into the Jordan. They're stepping into the river that represents man in his fallen state and all the sins of mankind. That's what they're stepping into. So as they step into the sin of the world, with the cross and the presence of God, the waters dry up. And where do they get pushed back to? The city of Adam. No coincidence there. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid the price for the sin of the world. He paid the price all the way back to Adam and all the way forward down the dead, to the Dead Sea for every human being that would ever live. <coughs> it doesn't mean that everybody gets to go to heaven, does it? But it means they're paid for. But if we want to believe in Jesus and accept the payment that he paid on our behalf, then we can cross that Jordan into the promised land. We cross that Jordan free from our sins that have been paid for, and we receive God into our lives. Amen? Amen. So there is power in the cross of Jesus and power in that blood. I'll end with this here. Listen to Joshua 3.16, one more time. That the waters which came down from upstream stood still and rose in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zeratan. So the waters that went down into the Sea of Arabah, the Salt Sea, or the Dead Sea, failed and were cut off. In other words, there's no more power to take you to hell if you trust in Jesus. And the people crossing over opposite um, Jericho. So you see, God made a way so that everybody could cross over. That's Joshua 3.16. Now compare that to John 3.16. <coughs> For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That what? Whosoever believes in him would not perish, but would have everlasting <coughs> life. <coughs> only God could put stuff like that in the Bible and hide it away. And think about that opening scripture from Psalm 119 today. Open my eyes so that I can see wondrous things out of your law. There are wondrous things hidden in the Bible for us each and every day. And when we come back to this in three weeks and finish up, there's some more revelation that I, I hope you'll enjoy. I hope you enjoyed this part of the teaching today. So, God bless you. Thank you.